Barbell deadlifts, barbell squats, overhead press, lat pull down, chest press. And when you're ready to stop, repeat. That's how we climb Olympia. When you push that extra rep, when you pull another set, when you lift that one last rep, you will climb the mountain and no one will forget. Bring on the build with the NASM Physique and Bodybuilding Coach Program. and welcome to this week's edition of the Master Instructor Roundtable. I'm Regional Master Instructor Marty Miller here with fellow Regional Master Instructor, dear friend, Miss Wendy Batts. Wendy, how are you doing today? I am so good, Marty. How are you? You know, my favorite time of the week, get to hang out with all these amazing NESM people, yourself. How could it be any better? I'm telling you. Well, you know, hopefully we're going to spread some knowledge about the core. This is one of my all-time favorite topics and anybody that's ever come to any of our conferences or meetings, like I'm usually slotted for something core related. So I'm really excited about this week's topic for sure. Yeah, I just get out of the way normally when we're doing live. So I'll <laughs> probably back off here a little bit, but I'm here, Wendy, if you need anything. But uh, now this is near and dear to both of our hearts. And let's go back, what, 20 years almost when we start practice as a model and everyone kind of thought we were nuts for doing core at the beginning of a workout. So I'm sure we'll get into some good conversations today. Well, and I think a lot of it stems from, you know, all of our conversations that we have each and every week. We talk about the importance of core and that every exercise could be considered a core. And I know that we've gotten some questions like, can you elaborate a little bit about that? Because, you know, unfortunately, when people think of the core and they really don't have a strong, you know, background in anatomy and biomechanics and they're just kind of getting into the industry or if you're talking to a client, you know, one of the first things you hear is that it's just about the abs. I need to work on my core. And so one of the first questions I ask is, first of all, why do you believe in that? You know, what what makes you say that? And can you define what the core is to you? And very frequently it is, well, I want to lose and they'll grab like, you know, the the love handles and, the, you know, the, the excess fat they might have around their tummy and say, I want this to go down. <laughs> and what we're going to talk about is everything can be a core exercise because of the muscles that actually make up the core itself. Yep. I mean, we have had many of those conversations, right? So I'm looking forward to jumping in here with you. Yeah. Well, let's talk about what we're going to talk about. How about that? <laughs> I like the way you say that. Well, you know, um, we just call it what it is. So we are definitely going to talk about the importance of the core. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, isolated exercises versus integrated exercises and then how we can truly say that every exercise could be core related and the reasons why. Yeah. I mean, I think that this should set the stage for everything core, but also truly give everyone a launching point on why the model is the way it is as well. Yeah. And why we do it first. I mean, obviously after the flexibility. So when we say first, we're not talking, you know, we're not just saying don't do your self myofascial, you know, techniques, that's going to be very important. Obviously, you're going to know what to roll based on your assessments and the things that seem to be overactive. So, again, we're trying to downregulate overactivity in certain muscles. Then we want to go ahead and stretch those muscles that we have, you know, seen to be short based on dysfunction that we might have seen in the overhead squat or any type of assessment that we've done. So when we go actually into the next um, slide, when we talk about the definition, you can see why when we're, we're actually program designing after that's done, we would go into activation and most of the activation exercises that we do are core related and specific. Yep. And uh, I just got done with my workout not too long ago and followed those steps. Yes. So I think, Wendy, uh, the key thing is you and I have been talking about this for so long is let's just get everybody on the same playing field of what the core is, whether it's personal trainers, whether it's clients. We should all know what we mean by that. And you've already talked about it. People think their core is maybe a muscle they can touch or a, per, a specific spot in their abdominals. But really, we have to know it as the lumbo-pelvic hip complex. Everybody here within the NASM family knows that we just shortened that up to LPHC. So that's, you know, looking at the body. So you can see here by definition, it has the following boundaries. The diaphragm superiorly at the top, abdominal muscles anteriorly towards the front of the body, and then laterally 
lumbar spine and gluteal muscles posteriorly and pelvic floor, hip musculature inferiorly. So there's a lot. And one of the ways I've always defined it to people more in a layman sense is chop off your arms and legs. And pretty much what you're left with 360 degrees around is your core. And we know there's approximately 29 muscles that make up the core. Yes. And so, you know, again, when you're when you're thinking about programming it, you know, it is important to teach clients how to breathe, you know, when they're actually doing different types of movement patterns. But if you have a weak core internally, so the small muscles that protect the spine, then when you start adding flexion, extension, rotation or even powerful movements, that's when we hear people complain like they might you know, feel something in their lower back or, you know, like, oh, this is really, you know, I, like I feel this and it doesn't feel comfortable. Unfortunately, most people don't like to train the core the right way in a certain, you know, in a certain process, because if you're really thinking about what Marty just said, those really deep inner vertebral muscles. So the little muscles that protect each and every vertebrae, people don't like to train it because they don't like, they can't see it. They only want to train the sexy muscles that you're going to see when you're out on the beach or, you know, um, poolside. And unfortunately, if you can, you know, if you can take, or, or fortunately, based on hopefully this podcast, if you take two steps back and you think about those small internal muscles that do protect the spine, cervical spine included, so your, your head and neck position, really, really important. Then at that point, when we start adding those muscles, you're going to have a better outcome. You're going to be stronger. You're going to be able to last longer throughout your workout. And you're going to make sure that the core is activated when you are doing, you know, other muscles, you know, like prime mover type exercises, you know, specifically because the core should always be engaged. Yep. And I think also, Wendy, to your point, when you talk about beach muscle, something just jumped in my mind. And this was a conversation I had on our Facebook page. So for those of you that aren't familiar, if you're certified with NASM, you can jump into our private Facebook page. Over 13,000 people, we have all kinds of conversations. And someone's like, well, look at this person. And they showed a, a picture of someone who was very muscular. And they're like, how could this group of muscles not be strong? So we have to not always worry about a picture in genetics, but we're also looking at, so somebody could have an, a phenomenal six pack, but in proportion to the other muscles, even though they are very strong or they're very lean, that doesn't mean proportionally their muscles are communicating well from the you know, inside around the vertebral spine compared to the external. So I do think that sometimes people get a little bit confused with what they see, who somebody who's saying to do this, this, and this, and you can look this way compared to true science, functional anatomy, and what you need to do to get proper human movement. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important too, based on that, you know, you're going to read, you know, throughout our content, especially, you know, if you are a brand new CPT, you've probably just read this as a reminder, if you're a veteran trainer and you haven't gone through our content in a long time, you know, we teach the drawing and maneuver, which means basically if you were to take your belly button, you draw it back towards the spine and you actually activate your glutes. So you're squeezing your glutes, making sure you're not using your adductor magnus, by the way. So really, truly activating the glutes and drawing in that's going to help secure those little muscles that are protecting the spine and getting those to fire. So when you do those other movements, um, you know, you know that those are trying to help you produce that amount of force without, you know, like if you don't do the drawing in mover maneuver, and then you start to lift and you're letting your, your belly expand and you're doing these other types of um, movements, that's not necessarily as ideal and, the, and then we hear more and more people having, you know, slipped discs or bulging discs or whatever those, um, you know, cases may be. And it's mainly because those were not activated the correct way. And so, yeah, you may be able to lift a lot, but could you lift more? And, you know, and so if you ever come to one of my courses or if you've ever been to one of my courses, I do a lot of different examples of somebody that's drawing in versus someone that's not someone that's an ideal five kinetic chain checkpoints drawing in and someone that's not. And so we start with that, especially in phase one is getting people used to that, because at that point, when you're drawing in and squeezing the glutes and you've got that, that draw and maneuver, and you're able to maintain that, you know, it's one of those things you're going to be able to do throughout the entire workout. But then as you progress and we start to get more into strength, that's when we really bring in that bracing and bracing is like, basically, if I said, Marty, I want you to stand there, I'm going to actually punch you in the stomach. You're going to do that, you know, bracing where you're going to allow me to punch you and but you're prepared for it. So you really try to to, to brace those muscles that that are mainly in, um, you know, the abdominal region. 
And so not saying that one is better than another, we use that again as a progression, but drawing in and teaching that first is really hard for people to grasp. So it's very important that you take time to make sure that that's done first and foremost, because that will make ensure that everything is a core exercise moving forward. Yeah, great points, Wendy. And for any of you just joining us today on the Master Instructor Roundtable, Marty Miller here with Wendy Batts. We are talking core, but truly, we're as we're moving forward now, everything is a core exercise. So we're going to go through some anatomy, and now we're going to talk about how everything you do, you do need to make a core focus exercise. So we're not going to dive into all the anatomy here. You have your resources in your textbook. The key thing is to, as we said before, understand what the definition of the core is, the lumbopelvic hip complex. Know that it's 360 degrees around, is from the top of your cervical spine all the way through your lumbar spine, it includes your glutes, shoulder blades, all of that fun stuff. So you're going to see all the different muscles here. So we could spend hours going through all the functions, but we have to be able to address these from a movement standpoint. And what we're showing first, these muscles here that you'll see, these are the muscles that many of our clients would never know they had. These are <laughs> muscles that they don't say, hey, can, you know, part of my goals is to make my lumbar multifidus more stable. They're never going to say that stuff. But we have to understand that we have to work from the inside out, get the intramuscular stabilization throughout the spine, you know, at a, at a high level. So as we progress through the model, as Wendy said, when you go to naturally pick something up in a strength phase, your spine is where it needs to be. It's stable. Pelvis is neutral. And then you can brace on top of that with the muscles, more of what our clients know. Or when you get into the strength phase and power phase, you start to move the spine with resistance or against resistance and at high speeds. So key thing is make sure you study your anatomy, but we're going to go through a couple slides here. So Wendy, is there anything you want to add to any of the uh, key muscles that we're talking about here? No, I mean, again, you know, make sure too, when we're talking about local versus global. And so when we were talking about those inner muscles, like Marty just said, your multifidi, the ones that you can't really see, we're talking at those as more as local. Those are the like localized within the spine. You, you know, if you've been with NASM from a long time, like for a very long time, like Marty and I, we learned it as intervertebral stability first. And again, that's just one muscle from vertebrae to vertebrae, um, you know, and, and we want to get those to fire. But then when we talk about the global muscles, those are the ones that are more um, on the outside. So when Marty was talking about kind of the, you know, the different muscles that you can see, those are the ones that move the spine. So you really want them to work hand in hand, but get the small ones to fire first. And again, that's why we focus on those exercises that we do. And we'll, we'll have some slides of what would be more appropriate when you're starting versus when you're getting up to the power phases. But just as you go through these um, different slides of anatomy that, that you know, we're going to show you, think about like, gosh, that is pretty deep or, OK, that makes sense. And that's why squeezing the glutes and drawing in and maintaining five net chain checkpoints in that postural alignment is so important, because if you can do that and maintain it, these small muscles will fire. And, and I think for those of you, as we move forward that are more interested in this type of anatomy, Think about the corrective exercise specialist. We go a little bit deeper, add to that level of knowledge that, um, you know, in the CPT, you start to see it, but in the corrective exercise specialist, we really go to that next level. Yes. It's one of my favorite courses. I say that all the time. I know I shouldn't have a favorite, but the CES, totally my favorite. <laughs> and the PES, I mean, they do go hand in hand, but. Right. Anyway. The complete model. So Wendy, That's you already right. kind of mentioned the transverse abdominis in the sense of the drawing in. So do you want to expand upon that? Yeah, I mean, you know, basically before movement occurs, the TVA is one of the first muscles to fire before we actually even see movement. And so um, so when we're talking about the transverse abdominis, you can see where it's located and the importance of that and how when you do draw in, that will help. It, it also kind of kind of makes you skinny. I always tell people, you know, abs and skinny, and that's one of my cues. But my clients know what I mean, because I'm not having them suck their gut in and to where they can't breathe. And then you're going to see elevation and in the rib cage and shoulders, when somebody draws in, you should see no change in the upper body movement. It literally is belly buttons is fine and abs in. So, so teaching that and then teaching how to breathe. So again, thinking about the diaphragm, because if someone's holding their breath, they really aren't activating those muscles correctly. And, you know, there are, you know, Mikey Watts has done a lot of things in the past, um, in some of our Optima, um, you know, uh, presentations. So if you guys haven't had a chance to, to listen to any of those and you're part of Club Connect, 
um, you know, I would tell you definitely listen to him because he is a breathing expert. There are people that are breathing experts and listening to what he says and teaching athletes how to breathe. It can be a complete game changer, a complete game changer as well, because, um, you know, if you don't breathe correctly, you're not oxygenating the tissues correctly and you will get tired faster. No, he critical stuff. And I think it's important to, you know, continue to focus on all those muscles. And the key thing is like a plank is a perfect example where people will hold their breath. You know, you've got to be able to do these stabilization exercises and have that natural breathing pattern. And that's where you have to, just like any other muscle, you have to train the diaphragm to do what it's supposed to do, not compensate for a weak core. Yes. Good point. I try. So then again, when, yeah, when we get to this, you know, and we're looking at the rectus abdominis, you've got to think guys, this is the muscle that when you actually do a crunch, when you're flexing your spine, this is the, the prime mover to make that happen. And you can see that it is more on the outside of the muscle. So now we're not talking about the ones that are really connected deeply within the vertebrae and the spinal cord. We're talking about the ones that you can see. So you know, because of what it does, if you've got really good activation on the little muscles that protect the spine, when you start flexing, extending and rotating, now we know that all of those other little muscles are also engaged to where it keeps the spine in ideal position to lessen the chances of bulging discs or pinch nerves or things that are going on um, because the vertebrae are out of alignment. So very important that before we start training these, you know, muscles that you can see and the ones that everybody wants to work, that those other muscles internally and deep um, are firing first. And then you're going to see, uh, you'll see these muscles pop a lot quicker. I mean, I don't know how else to say that. I mean, diet does play a huge role because everyone has a six pack somewhere. It's just, can you see it? Well, it depends on how many layers of fat are above it. So diet will also play a role of what you can and cannot see when you are out on the beach or in the pool. <laughs> that, that's critical. And I remember the days, you know, early in my career, everyone thought crunches and leg raises was the way to prevent back injuries. Is mm-hmm. I, I've seen a shift now. People understand planks and side planks and press outs and all that. So thank goodness that that, but remember back in the day, that's all people thought was I just got to do crunches and bunches, right? And I'm not going to have back problems. And it's actually probably exacerbated a lot of people's back problems because they didn't have that local musculature firing or that intervertebral stabilization. They were only focused on the global muscles in the way we learned it, Wendy, at least I, I can speak for myself. I think you were probably in that same ballpark is think of like a mast on a sailboat, right? The spine is the mast and the guy wires would all be those little muscles that connect to the sail. So if a big gust comes and that sail catches it and that mass isn't stable and those guy wires can't attach that big sail to that mast, What's going to happen to the mass? It's going to break, tip over, et cetera. And that's what I think people did for a long time was hyper-focus on the movement muscles, the crunch, you know, the rectus abdominis and all those. And then they would actually probably increase their likelihood of back problems. And I think another another issue that we see very commonly when, when crunches are even being performed, you know, people, because I learned like sit-ups were bad because again, if you did sit-ups, like a pure full sit-up, that it's going to lead to back issues. And so, you know, when I started watching people do crunches, they actually did not really bend their spine. They didn't flex it. They were actually using more hip flexors, which then started having issues because you were activating more of the psoas. And for those of you guys know the psoas, it runs deep and it connects to every one of your lumbar spine and your lower back. And so instead of using your TV or your, I'm sorry, your rectus abdominis, you were actually using more of your psoas or one of your hip flexors. And so therefore you really weren't strengthening your abs. And so one of the things that I find interesting is when I try to get people to get out of just crunches, I want to see, can you do a full sit up? Because sit ups an activity of daily living. Can you sit up out of bed? Can you sit up and get up off the floor if you're laying flat? Those are things that I noticed even decreasing and declining in my father who is getting older because he wasn't used to using those muscles. And so really going through making a pure C with the spine, actually curving it into flexion. And then even in back extensions, going into extension, not hyperextension, but to a safe position and then learning to to rotate properly, you will see how much better you feel, how much better your lower back feels. And you're laying off those muscles that are pulling and tugging on that low back that should really not be activated when you're doing those kind of exercises. So I know. 
And, um, you know, today on the Master Instructor Roundtable, Marty Miller and myself, Wendy Batts, we're talking everything core. So, I mean, again, we're talking a lot about anatomy. We're talking about those really deep muscles. We're talking about the muscles that move and extend and rotate the spine. All of these guys play such a huge and important role in everything that you do each and every day and really taking the time to spend, you know, do, you know, spend time doing core work with your clients and yourself is only going to help you get stronger and more powerful long term with decreasing the chances of low back pain or hurting anything in some of your discs. Um, you need to keep those discs in the vertebrae as healthy as possible. That's great. That, that is very wise advice. So now we're going to move into some more of the global muscles. Again, these are things that people see all the time. We've got our, you know, our obliques, internal, external oblique. We've got our rectus spinae. And then, yes, the latissimus dorso is a big part of the core muscles. Yes. And we don't, sometimes we, we forget those, but remember where the lats, you know, they start in the lower back, they go all through the back and they actually insert in the front of the shoulder. So if you've got rounded shoulders and anterior pelvic tilt, so a low back arch and you're having all these issues, guys, it's probably the lat, you know, lengthen the lat, strengthen the muscles that are in the mid to lower back, get rotation, thoracic rotation and movement, because unfortunately we're getting more movement from cervical spine and lower back. And we should have the movement actually in the thoracic spine. So, you know, when you're looking at the lats and you're focusing on it, don't just worry about strengthening it. Make sure that it's actually in the right position first. So therefore, when you do strengthen it, you're going to have a better outcome. Right. And, and those lats are the key muscle that attach the upper body and lower body. So right there in the center of the pelvis. So they have a key role in all these movement dysfunctions as well. Indeed. And I'm working on mine. <laughs> you want to take this one? Sure. So Wendy, you talked about the hip flexor complex, right? So there's not just a hip flexor muscle. So Wendy had did a great job of talking about be careful of targeting the, or accidentally targeting the hip flexors when you're really trying to target other muscles. There might be a time and a place you do that, but we need to know if we're going to do it, why we're going to do it. And you'd have to understand the anatomy. So when you look here at the hip flexors complex, we got the iliopsoas, which is the iliacus and psoas major. And they start on the anterior portion of the thigh and then they kind of go and take a deep dive into the back and they attach on the last five vertebrae. So they have a very powerful connection and they can pull into that anterior tilted position. So that's why, we, you know, when you look at your movement assessments, you look at anterior pelvic tilt, um, excessive forward lean, these muscles can be truly overactive in a lot of people, but we do have to understand their function within the, um, you know, the core and not saying we'll never train the hip flexor complex, but let's just understand where they are, what they do. And then if, and when you'd want to train them. Yeah. Cause I mean, hip flexors obviously are important, but we are sitting in more of a hip flex position. And so to your point, Marty, you know, get more length back into your hip flexors first, strengthen the glutes because think about, you know, your agonist antagonist. So if your hip flexors are tight or overactive, you know, obviously it's going to be pulling the spine forward. We need to really work on trying to get the spine back into proper neutral position and strengthen the glutes will help do that as well. So that's why, you know, if somebody is constantly working their hip flexor, hip flexor, hip flexor, especially if they're runners or they're walking a lot or they're sitting a lot, those guys are so overworked and underpaid, but the glutes have kind of, you know, shut off a little bit. I mean, they're still working. They're just not firing to their full potential. And guys, the, you know, the glutes are your powerhouse. That's where you really are going to help decrease low back issues and dysfunction. It's also going to help you when you're actually doing lower body or when you decide that you're going to do, you know, your high intensity exercises or your cardio or whatever those cases are. Um, you've got to make sure you lay off of those a little bit and get them back into proper positioning before you start to just, you know, put a beating on them. <laughs> yeah. And another shameless plug is if this interests you, a corrective exercise specialist is an absolute way to go because we will take a deeper dive into this anatomy and cover exactly what we're talking about. So you can really start to segment, okay, I see this motion. So it's this muscle or this muscle will be allowing it. This muscle will be causing it. So it's that next layer of knowledge from a functional anatomy standpoint. Yes. So the isolated exercises, this is where we're really focusing kind of more on your phase one type exercises. So again, we were talking about really diving deep into the muscles that protect the spine vertebrae to vertebrae. And we do that by doing exercises that have little to no joint motion of the spine. So we're not flexing, 
We're not extending. We're really focusing on drawing in, getting glute activation correctly, maintaining a neutral spine. And again, the five kinetic chain checkpoints. And these are some of the, you know, exercises that Marty and I do very often with ourselves as well as our clients, especially in the beginning, um, you know, just a basic plank, you know, and instead of holding for 60 seconds, why, why not? Because we, it's all about a competition. You want to think about doing the beginning portions for reps, coming up, holding three to four seconds, maintaining proper positioning, relaxing, coming out of that, popping back up, making sure you've got, you know, a flat back. So you're, if you've got a winger, meaning that the, the shoulder blades are coming up, that you're working on the serratus anterior to, to get those shoulder blades to lie back flat onto the back. Um, you know, and, and doing those for 12 to 20 repetitions with that, you know, just a short hold. And then when you do that, because we move where you have to, you know, activate, relax, activate, relax. We don't sit there for 60 seconds and, and have to do movements. And so that's really over time, those muscles are going to fatigue, especially if they're weak. And you're really just holding yourself up with your toes and your arms. We want to make sure that it's the centerpiece that we're focusing on. And so shorter amounts of time in a hold. For repetitions, again, making sure that the feet and heels do not touch each other, because if they do, you're probably cheating using your adductor magnus and not firing your glutes. That is a really good starting position. And it's very, very challenging for people, even though we take it for granted. So it might be easy for you, but it might not be easy for your clients. So please keep that in mind in the beginning. But then you see like the bird dogs or, ice, you know, opposite arm, opposite leg. Those are very good. Again, now you're fighting gravity, having to maintain that drawing in position. Same thing with the side plank, making sure you've got good alignment, um, holding for three to four seconds and doing those for reps as well. The pal off press, um, that's one that I like or anti-rotation, depending on, on you know, how, whatever you want to call it. It's the same thing. But holding again, three to four seconds when you're in the outward position, bringing it back in maintaining very good alignment within, you know, your abs and your glutes. And then of course the floor bridge. And I've said this every podcast that we talk about or webinar that we talk about exercises, every one of my clients will start with bridges. I don't care what phase you're in because I want to make sure that the hip flexors are open, the glutes are squeezed. Then I have them do lateral tube walking. And then we go into whatever, you know, whatever other activation exercises we need to do. But to me, those are two very important areas I want to make sure are activated at the highest level. So no matter what phase of training we're in, I know I at least got those started. Great point, Wendy. And for any of you just joining us today, Marty Miller here with Wendy Batts on the Master Instructor Roundtable. We're talking everything core. And Wendy, the only thing I'm going to add to the great points that you made on those, I like doing something on the ground where the shoulder blades are engaged because most people don't associate that. So great points. Now, when we look at our integrated, every exercise we do, and again, we could have picked countless. Whether I was doing a chest press on a bench today with dumbbells, I still need to make sure that my core is in a neutral position. I draw the belly button in. I squeeze my glutes. When I put my feet on the ground, they're neutral. Then I'm focusing on a press. I don't just forget that my core exists. So that's what we really mean when we name this everything is a core exercise. So yes, it's easier to see some integrated core exercises here with a windmill, you can see, or however she's doing, a, a, I should say a kettlebell. She's doing a partial a part of a kettlebell get up here. We don't know if she did the whole thing or not, but even this here, she's got those shoulders stacked, her head's in the right position, belly button's drawn in. You can see the cable rotation here as you're coming up through the diagonal pattern, whether it's a medicine ball throw. That's where, as Wendy said, we start with learning how to position our spine. Then we can start to add movement and then potentially add speed. But the cueing from the whole time you're talking to your client is truly, truly getting them to focus on their core. You know, for me, Wendy, and I'm sure you're similar, if I was doing a standing chest press, right, with cables so that way I'm not supported, I don't have to really focus on the form and technique of sometimes that the main part of the exercise as much as keeping someone's core locked in, right? Mm -hmm. People know how to press. People know how to do bicep curls. I'm not saying I ignore that part, but I don't focus on the chest press part only and not cue the core throughout the entire exercise. 
Well, and I mean, even, you know, one of the, the exercises that I see the most where I'm like, what is happening here? Or when people do a bicep curl, everybody wants to work the, the, the gun show. It's all really important that your arms look great. I, I totally 100% get it. Um, because again, you know, I don't want to have flabby arms as I age. I mean, it's important to me as well. But if you're swinging your lower back and you're swinging and you're really using more momentum versus elbow flexion or extension, whatever it is that you're doing, then you know that your core isn't engaged because you wouldn't have that swinging effect. You would literally be standing in one position and utilizing slow and controlled movements to therefore really focus on that prime mover. And so when we were talking, you know, Marty, you even said this, that everything's an exercise. If you see improper movement patterns and you see movement coming from the spine that shouldn't be there, or even the hip and, and things are moving out of, out of whack, then you're not really engaging those muscles you are going to burn more calories if you're engaging more muscles. You're going to get more, um, you know, calories expended if you're using more muscles, even though you're focusing on just something as simple as a bicep. And so, you know, all of this plays an important role. But again, you don't want to end up leading yourself in down the path of allowing this crazy momentum thing to happen because you're really not going to execute what you're trying to do on the prime mover. But you could also increase the chances of injury because you're, 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 you're not, not focusing on those little muscles that protect the vertebrae. Right. And today as a finisher, I was again, gun show, I was doing some triceps. I did the rope and my whole focus was stacking my shoulder blades into protraction. Right. And, you know, a retraction, I should say, and depression because the rope wants to elevate my shoulders, belly button in glutes tight. So yes, I was doing tricep, but my whole focus was what the exercise was trying to take me out of which is it's trying to bring me to shoulder elevation. So I'm like, okay, depression, retraction, then do my triceps, draw the belly button in and squeeze the glutes, right? I could have just sat there and ripped off the reps with the tricep rope, but I'm losing all that valuable time under tension for the core. Indeed. Now the fun stuff, right? The ones that we kind of hinted about, like how everything is a core exercise. So whether you're doing farmer carries, whether I'm doing a one-sided farmer carry, so now you get anti-rotation as you're doing going through a gait cycle, right? This person's doing a very good job. Maybe her chin could be back just a little bit more, but it looks like she's got her shoulders in that nice neutral position, but slight retraction, right? And then I'm a big fan of our skill mill here at Techno Gym because I have to be the motor and it makes me stand upright. I today did this exercise. I did the bottom up kettlebell press. Why would I grab a dumbbell when I can create that instability and have to fight my body wanting to move from one side to the other? I gave an example how a simple tricep rope extension. Wendy, you talked about bicep curls. Everything must be a core exercise. And that way, one, maybe you don't have to target it as much if your workout's in a short period of time. But these muscles are forced to work all day long. So why wouldn't we put a focus and an emphasis throughout every exercise? And we know that it's going to make the core more resilient to injury as well. Yes. That's it. That's all you got. <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know what? I wish I could say more, but I mean, that's really important. I mean, you know, you need your core. The core, you know, think of a core of an apple, everything needs a core and it starts at the core. And so therefore you need to have a strong core or, you know, or things just start to break down. And, and that's pretty much how, unfortunately, how things are in life. But another way of looking at it too, when we talk constantly about the five kinetic chain checkpoints, you know, the reason that we have people line up in this position and we really are focusing, especially in the very beginning when we're doing the overhead squat, is this is the most ideal position because your joints are stacked up the way that they're meant to be stacked up. You're going to have good link tension relationships on each side of the joint, meaning that if I'm really focusing on one um, muscle, I'm really probably using that one muscle and not using synergists or other muscles to help me produce a movement that should not be incorporated at that time. And so when we go through and we talk about the five kinetic chain checkpoints, we're putting ourselves in a good position. And then we want to maintain that position. So abs in, you know, um, abs in skinny, glutes in tight. And then at that point, you're going to you know, have a better outcome. So there is a purpose of why we teach things in the, the CPT the way we do, especially for some beginners, because these has been shown by research of, of decreasing the stress to joints or decreasing the chances of injuries because we know that everything, you know, think about your elbow. I mean, something as simple as an elbow, if your elbow 
which is a hinge joint, is not lined up correctly and you're forcing it into a position that it's not meant to, over time you're going to end up having pain in that in that joint. Same thing, think of a door, you know, it's a hinge joint as well, right? Or a hinge. If it's not lined up correctly, the door doesn't shut correctly, you're going to end up having, you know, everything's going to start to become off kilter. So we want everything to be lined up the way that it's intended to. We want to produce the right amount of movement, but execute the 29 muscles that make up the core, then produce whatever exercise you want to do, you're going to have more muscles firing. So you're going to be able to lift more weight, which is ideally what people want. I want to get stronger. I want to look better. So if you want to engage the core and you can like lift more on a chest press, you know, back, thighs, tries everything. And if you don't believe me, try it. Don't squeeze your stomach, stand any way you want. Try to do your, your bicep curls and then put yourself in the five kinetic chain check points, draw in, squeeze your glutes and try to do the same thing. And tell me if you can see and or feel a difference. I agree. See, just like that. There you go. <laughs> so key takeaways. Uh, you know, I think that you can find that Wendy and I are very passionate about this topic. Focus on the anatomy, understand the role of the local and the global muscles to the level you're at right now. And if you want more information, if you're not in the CES, we have that exercise progressions for both the local and global muscles are essential. Just Again, if you go back to those five kinetic chain checkpoints, you're fixing some of that without even really knowing that you're doing it, right? Be in the five kinetic chain checkpoints, draw in, squeeze the glutes, core is going to be going. And then ensure that every exercise is that core exercise. Don't lose sight of a bicep curl, a tricep extension, whatever it is, that there has to be a focus on the core during every single exercise. Yes. Fabulous. So Wendy, why don't you tell these amazing people how to get a hold of you? Yep. If you guys have any questions, you can always reach out to me via email at wendy.bats at nasm.org, or you can find me on Instagram at wendy.bats13. And our amazing producer, Eric, on cue, brings up my information, dr.martymiller72 for Instagram, and then my email, marty.miller at nasm.org. So, Wendy, thank you for sharing your passion in one of your favorite topics, CORE, with us today. And I know, um, at least I'm believing everyone got some amazing information. And for any of you that need to get a hold of us, don't hesitate. You got our contact information. And most importantly, we look forward to seeing you again next week on the Master Instructor Roundtable.